How are you all? I hope you enjoy your week. And tonight I ask the Lord to continue to bless each one of you and to fill you with his Holy Spirit and that he will bless you with his love, his joy, and his peace. You know, we've been studying the biography of Ellen White, and we mentioned that it is helpful for us to learn from her experiences because the lesson learned will be useful for us. She said the history will repeat itself before Jesus returns. And one of the lessons we learn is how important it is to study the scriptures diligently. So we'll be able to distinguish what is truth and what is falsehood. In the last studies, Ellen White mentioned her early ministry was constantly being interfered by the spiritualizers. And they confused many of the Advent believers. Who are these people? And what's the difference between the spiritualizers and the spiritualists that we have today. While well, some said the spiritualists or the spiritists that we have today were in, evolved from the spiritualizers. Spiritualizers, the term that Ellen White used in her early writings. Just a review. What do spiritualizers believe? The ones that were interfering God's people in the early days. Well, the spiritualizers believe Christ had come on October 22nd, 1844 and came in the form of spirit and was living in their hearts. And they established the theory that heaven, God, and Christ are not in material form, but are spirits. These spiritualizers were convinced that they were sanctified, holy, and already sealed by God. And so they were living already in the kingdom of God in spirit. They also believed all their thoughts were holy because they were sanctified already. And therefore, it was impossible for them to sin. It sounds strange to us, doesn't it? Well, and who are the spiritualists, the ones that we have today? Remember, I said some people think that they were a branch or of, or, or an ev evolution of the spiritualizer that, you know, during Alan's time. The spiritualists we have today also believe in the spiritual realm and that there are communications between the spiritual world and the material world in various degrees. The spiritual world that they believe is where the spirit of the dead dwells and they communicate with the dead. Remember the story of King Saul? He looked for the medium to raise the spirit of Samuel from the dead. You can read that story in 1 Samuel chapter 28. So during the 1800s and early 1900s, that's when Ellen White lived, right? Spiritualism or fanaticism flourished. Emotional driven religion was very popular. So spiritualism developed and reached its peak growth in membership from the 1840s to the 1920s especially in the English-speaking countries. And by 1897, spiritualism was said to have more than 8 million followers in the United States and Europe, mostly drawn from the middle and upper classes. So what a confusing time. And no, no different than from today, right? God is merciful, and he did not allow these lies to affect the growing church. So he gave Alan visions, vision that firmly established the personality of God and Christ, 
the reality of heaven and the reward to the faithful and the resurrections. And this guidance from God saved the emerging church. Some of these visions that we have studied the last few weeks. So what did the Bible say about spiritualists or spiritists? In Leviticus 19.31, it says, Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And in Isaiah 8.19, When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a, per, a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? We Christians also believe in the spirit, but not the spirit of the dead, but the eternal spirit of God. Let us continue to explore and get understanding of the truth what does the Bible have to say about the Holy Spirit from God? John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So how do we know whether the spirit is from God and not from the devil? These verses will help us and guide us to make the distinction. 1 John 4, verse 1, 2, 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. In other verse. 1 John 3, 24. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Another one, Galatians 4, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. So don't believe in every spirit. The Holy Spirit from God recognized Jesus is the Christ. And the Holy Spirit abides in the commandment keepers and they produce fruit. Another question. Is the second coming of Jesus a spiritual return and not literal? Well, this is what our doctrine says. The second coming of Christ is the blessed hope of the church, the grand climax of the gospel. The Savior's coming will be literal, personal, visible, and worldwide. When he returns, the righteous dead will be resurrected and together with the righteous living will be glorified and taken to heaven. And furthermore, this is what the Bible says. Matthew 24, 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Does this sound like a spiritual return? 
Another verse, John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. So according to this verse, God the Father's house has many mansions. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. It doesn't sound like he is preparing a spiritual mansion for us. And furthermore, what does the Apostle John describe in Revelation 1-7? It also doesn't sound like a spiritual coming of Christ too. Let's read. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, and even those who pierced him, and all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. So, were the spiritualizer in Ellen White's day genuine followers of Christ, but were just confused? Well, some of them were, and God instructed Ellen to continue to minister to them and not to give up on them. But there were some that were taking advantage of the situation for their own pleasure and for their material gain. They were not commandment keepers of God and were not living a holy life. According to Ellen White, some of them took wives for themselves, besides the one that they already married to. Let's read from her quotes. The spiritualizers who claimed that they were sanctified, they might have a spiritual wife, they aver that if they love one another as Christians, they were perfectly safe. Some took the matter a step further and taught that since they were perfectly sanctified, they could do whatever they want to without sinning. A few attended meetings in the nude and a few exchanged wives. They thought it right to show their love for one another and that what they did was perfectly innocent. These spiritualizers, she also called them fanatics, have led many astray from the truth. Many of these believers initially overjoy and believe Ellen's testimony regarding the truth about October 22nd, 1844. So what was the truth? Just a recap. According to her vision, which is given by Christ, that October 22nd, 1844, was not Jesus' second coming, but something actually happened in heaven. And it was Jesus entering into the Holy of Holies in the heavenly sanctuary. These people believed at first on this explanation from Ellen, but Sadly, not long after that, during Alan's absence, the spiritualizer persuaded them in their strange theory. And because their faith was still weak and immature, they succumbed to the falsehoods. Remember, I said God did not give up on them. They were just confused. So he told Alan to continue to minister to them. Well, the situation was a very frustrating thing for a teenager who was only 17 years old. Not only her work was undone by the fanatics or spiritualizers, but she also had to endure people's slanders and ridicules. Ellen went through some severe trials Remember I mentioned in previous Vesper that there were people who spread rumors that 
Ellen visions were not real and that she was being mesmerized. Mesmerized, another word for that is hypnotized. And the burden of doing God's work was so heavy on her that she became quite ill a few, time, a few times. But God sustained her. And there was another time because of the frequent slandering that she even began to doubt her own experience. This is what she said. While at family prayers one morning, the power of God began to rest upon me. And the thought rushed into my mind that it was mesmerism and I resisted it. Immediately I was struck dumb, not able to talk and for a few moments was lost to everything around me. I then saw my sin in doubting the power of God, and for that and that for do, so doing, I was struck dumb, and that my tongue would be loose in less than 24 hours. So she couldn't talk for a day, and she had to communicate through a slate in regard to what God has shown her. So after that, she said she dare not doubt or resist the power of God, no matter what others might thought of her. In late spring or early summer of 1845, God gave Ellen a new task. She was still 17 only. Remember I mentioned that Ellen didn't have much education due to the accident that caused her a head trauma. She couldn't read without having headaches or dizzy spells. And whenever she tried to write, her hand would tremble and she couldn't even hold the pen steadily. One day, while she was in vision, she was commanded by an angel to write down her vision. So she attempted and her hand became steady, and she could hold the pen and write. This is what she said. The Lord has said, Write out the things which I shall give you. My hand that was feeble and trembling because of infirmities became steady as soon as I took the pen in my hand. And since those first writings, I have been able to write. God has given me the ability to write. That right hand scarcely ever has a disagreeable sensation. It never wearies. It seldom ever trembles. She obeyed and she wrote many articles and books. So how many? At the time of her death, 1915, Ellen White's literary productions total approximately 100,000 pages. 24 books in current circulation, two book manuscript ready for publication, 5,000 periodical articles in the journals of the church, and more than 200 tracts and pamphlets approximately 35,000 typewritten pages of manuscript documents and letters, 2,000 handwritten letters and diary material comprising, when copied in other, 15,000 typewritten pages. Compilation made after her death from Ellen White's writing bring the total number of books currently in print to more than 130. So you see, God is merciful. In a time of perplexities, he sent a messenger to enlighten the dark, to disentangle the confusions, not only once or twice, but he continued to help his people until they were grounded with the truth. So with Alan's book, we are still benefiting from them even after more than 100 years later. So next week, we're going to continue 
with her ministry and her life, her experiences. Happy Sabbath.